And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Courtney. We're thankful to the Lord for his amazing grace. Are we not? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we sing that song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And Father, we may compare ourselves with the person sitting next to us, and we may compare ourselves with the person at work or a person at home or a person at the restaurant. And Lord, in comparison to them, Lord, we're not so bad. But Lord, as we come into your presence, we come into your midst. Father, as we see your face, as you appear before us, we say, woe is me, for we are undone. Our sin is ever before you. And Lord, we are, we are, we should get your punishment. Father, you should banish us. You should um, move us as far as the east is from the west. But yet, Lord, your love is so great. <laughs> Your love is so great, Lord, that you, that you desire to have a relationship with us and you did what needed to be done in order for us to do that. You sent your son, Jesus. So, Father, this morning we, are, we come before you as, 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 wretched sin, as wretched sinners, but, Lord, we don't stay that way because you have saved us through your son, Jesus. We can have that relationship with you and we can have an eternity with you. Father, you can control our lives. You can be in charge of our life. And, Lord, we know that what you desire is best. So, Father, this morning our prayer is that we may all feel your grace, that we may all know your grace. We may all feel your forgiveness. And, Father, my prayer is that each one would have a relationship with you through your son, Jesus. And, Lord, that today might be the day for any that do not to have that relationship begin. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to worship you today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning in our small groups, we finished up our series uh, entitled The True Picture of Christmas. And over the last six weeks, we have looked at different, we have looked at Christmas from different perspectives. We, We started way back six weeks ago and looked in the book of Isaiah and saw what the prophets had to say and saw Christmas from their perspective. Uh, They never saw it, but yet they knew that it was coming. And then we looked at at Joseph, and we looked at Christmas through through Joseph's eyes, and then through Mary's eyes, and then Jesus was born, and the angels came, and they announced to the shepherds and to the world that that joy was here, and that uh, a Savior has been born in the city of David, and he has been born for each one of us. And then last week we looked at after Jesus was born and they, they took Jesus to the temple to present him there, uh, Simeon came over and who, who was waiting for the consolation, who was waiting for the Messiah to come, saw in the eyes of Jesus, saw that Messiah. And he made some, uh, some prophecy about the life of Jesus and to his mom. And then this morning as we were um, studying, we concluded with the, with the wise men or the magi from the east who had come to, to worship Jesus and to present to him their gifts and to bow down in his presence and to give him glory as was due the king who was born um, that day or not that day but, but, but previously as they came into the presence of 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 Jesus. Now, uh, King Herod, on the other hand, when he heard about the news of Jesus' birth, uh, he had a fake desire to worship Jesus. The, the, the Magi came to Jerusalem, and they were looking for Jesus, and the king said, now, we have found where he is. He's in Bethlehem, and I want you to go there, but, be, but what I want you to do is after you've worshipped him, I want you to come back, and I want you to tell me where he is so that I, too, can worship him. And, of course, Herod had no inclination at all to worship Jesus. He only wanted to kill him. 
and his his desire for worship was fake and uh, um, it was not real at all and King Herod's actions was a forerunner of the actions of the Roman soldiers as Jesus was to be crucified on the cross. Uh, They, too, brought him some gifts. Uh, And they, too, like Herod, uh, offered up fake worship. And I want you to take a look at that with me this morning. We're going to look in John's Gospel, John chapter 19, uh, reading verses 1 through 6. Uh, You can look it up in your Bible. Uh, in the in the uh, worship folder on the back of the outline, I have it printed out if you'd like to look at that as well. Uh, John 19, uh, beginning in verse 1. And here notice uh, the actions of the soldiers in response to Jesus. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns. And put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe. And they went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. And when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Then I want us to look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 29, to give us to kind of complete this, this picture of Jesus that we see here in the text this morning. Uh, and then, verse 29, and then they twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head, just like John has told us. But we get a little more information here. They put a staff in his right hand. And then they knelt in front of him, and they mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. And so this morning, the question I want to ask is, what are the marks of true worship? What are the marks of real worship? And that's kind of like our journey today. That's where, that's where we're going this morning. So I want you to follow me, and as we, as we kind of figure out and find out What are the true marks of worship? And the reason why I want to do that is that, and this is our take home, uh, this is our takeaway today. The reason why I want to look at the marks of true worship is because as we begin this new year, as we begin this new year, let us offer up uh, true worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we begin this, this first Sunday of 2019, let's begin it by offering up true worship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so hopefully that's where we're going this morning, and I I hope that you'll follow along with me, and when we leave here today, that we will have with us and and understand what true worship, some of the marks of true, real worship, the kind of worship that the Lord accepts. So to do that, we're going to look back at our text in in John chapter 19, and, and we're going to see that that first of all, that these soldiers brought Jesus some false symbols of royalty. We're going to look at them, some false symbols of royalty. The first thing that they did was that they placed a crown on his head, a crown of thorns on his head. Now, Now, I don't know if you know much about crowns. I don't know if you've ever worn a crown, Um, but crowns are not comfortable. They're, They're not meant to be comfortable at all. Uh, they are heavy. Crowns are hot. Uh, crowns give you hat hair. If, if if you know what that is, they give you. They give you. I don't know what hat hair is. All right. I, I, so I I can't tell you. Probably Dennis could, but I I can't I can't tell you. But but kings kings endured the irritation 
of wearing a crown because they carried some significance. If you wore the crown, it meant that you had the power. And so when, when someone placed a crown on another person's head, what that was symbolizing, what that was communicating was that, that this person was, was submitting themselves to the power of the person that they were going to put the crown on. And kings kind of, of like that. But that's not what we see here. Uh, this time, when they put the crown of thorns on Jesus' head, they are mocking him. Uh, it, it was more than just an irritation. It was a torture. And the Romans despised the Jews. And now here they had at their, at their fingertips, if you will, here they had this, this impotent king of the Jews right before them. And they couldn't pass up the chance to humiliate him as much as possible. And so they put this crown of thorns on his head to symbolize the hatred the hatred that they had for Jesus and for all of the Jews. And then, and then after that, another symbol of false royalty is that they put upon him a purple robe. Now, it wasn't like a good purple robe. It was a, um, a, a discarded purple robe. You see, back in the day, purple robes weren't easy to find. You couldn't get them at the Walmart. You couldn't order them on Amazon and get two-day delivery. Uh, so, so, so purple robes uh, were very hard to find. In fact, only the king had them. And so, so, so this king, this King Herod, who is a descendant of the King Herod when Jesus was born. You notice that? When Jesus was born, who was king? Herod. When, when Jesus is crucified, who is king? Herod. Not the same king. Not two different kings. Uh, that one was an ancestor of, of the other, of the other one. Um, but it was this king Herod, as Jesus was to be crucified, who first saw him and first put the purple robe on him. Now, uh, Herod wasn't going to use his purple robe. Uh, Herod wasn't going to get Jewish blood all over his clothes, clothes. But he had one somewhere. It was an old one, a discarded one. Um, one that the color had kind of faded. One that maybe was ripped up and torn. One that wasn't used anymore. One that, that, was, that was, they were getting ready to throw away maybe. And so they, they pick up this, this, this purple robe out of the trash can. And they put it on Jesus, a cast off, uh, something that was originally meant to display luxury and beauty and power. Now on Jesus, it was ugly. Um, it was placed on the back of one whose flesh had already been shredded by the beatings and the whippings of the soldiers before him and so they give him these false sense false symbols of royalty this crown of thorns this this purple robe and then as we read in the matthew passage they bring to jesus a staff for his right hand if you look at some of the translations what the staff is it's a staff reed it's a reed it's it's something they got outside a pole uh, and it was meant to be a scepter. If you were a king, you had a scepter. And the scepter was iron, and it was, it, 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 it was strong. And kings would rule with their scepter. And they would pass judgment with their scepter. They would show their authority with their scepter. And they give this, this reed to Jesus. And the reed that, and the scepter that he had, the reed that he had, the staff that he had, wasn't a strong iron scepter, but it was something that just kind of waved in the wind. You see, they were making fun of him as the king with his scepter, with his power. Um, it, it was, it, it would, it would just go back and forth and it was easily broken. 
And so they offer Jesus these, these symbols of royalty. And, and then, and then they, they bring uh, to Jesus these false expressions of worship. Notice what they do. Notice what they do in, in the Matthew passage. Uh, they, they lower themselves in his sight. They knelt in front of him. Uh, whenever people truly, really, honestly worship, they come before the one that they are worshiping and they lower themselves and they raise up the one that they're worshiping. Um, John the Baptist, in, in John chapter 3, verse 30, uh, John the Baptist said this uh, in, in worship of the Lord. He said, he must increase. I must decrease. He knelt before the Lord. He elevated. Um, he elevated Jesus. You know, uh, memorizing scripture sometimes is hard. Sometimes it's difficult. I, I've told you before, I really do well at memorizing scripture when they're short. You know, Jesus wept. I have that down. I have that down. Okay. Here's another one. John 3, verse 30. It's good to have down. He must increase and I must decrease. God must increase in my heart, in my life, in my influence, and, and, and I must decrease the things that I want, uh, the, the things that I'm looking, that must decrease. God must increase. And so, so they, they bow down and they knelt before him. Now, the magi, the wise men, when they came, they expressed their worship not only by physically bowing down in front of Jesus, but also through the sacrifices they made. They bowed their knees, the Magi. They, they, they bowed their hearts. They presented their gifts. But those who came before Jesus on this day came with hard hearts. They presented a show before him as they knelt down. But that's all it was, was just a show. They wanted people to see him. After they got up, they lived their normal lives. They, they left there once the show was over. They did life as they'd always done life. But true worship always produces a change in direction. The Magi come and they worship the Lord. And then they are told in a dream to return what? A different way. They changed direction. They did not go back the way that they came. Worshippers, worshippers rise from their worship. Changed. The evidence of whether or not we have worshipped this morning is whether or not when we leave here, we leave as a changed people. If, if, if we don't change, if, if we don't leave here somehow changed in some way, then we really haven't worshipped. Because every time we come into the presence of God, it changes us. We, 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 we leave here a different person. We have a, we, we have a better hope. We have greater assurance. We have a better promise. We have a, a greater desire to live for the Lord. We change. And so they brought this false expression of worship as they knelt and bowed down for the Lord, and they didn't change at all. And then secondly, they, they spoke words of praise in his hearing. They praised him. Hail, hail, king of the Jews. Hail him. Hail, praise, honor. And they didn't mean it at all. Praising heroes and celebrities can get pretty loud, you know. Um, have you ever been to a baseball game? Or a football game? Or a music concert? And, and, and the baseball star comes on to the field. Our, our team comes on to the field. The person that we came to see at the music concert comes out on stage. And man, the crowd goes wild. Crowd goes wild. Now, some of you may may not believe this. I'm going to, I'm going to share something, and, and you may not believe this, but praising Jesus can get loud too. How ironic it is that we jump up and down uh, when one of our favorite sports teams uh, we 
we stomp our feet and we clap our hands at the music concert. Or when Debbie has us do it on Sunday morning, which I didn't know that that was what you were going to do until, until you did it. We do all of that. But we don't even grunt for Jesus. Don't even grunt. We just, we just sit there. We, we, we just sit there. And it's not really ironic. It's kind of sad. But the soldiers here were loud in their praise of Jesus. But it was just a mockery. Just a mockery. They bowed down before him. And they didn't change. They praise him. And they're just mocking him. And then they... They, they do something else. I don't know really how to, how to put it, uh, except to say that, that they impacted him with their touch. Uh, the scripture says they slapped him in the face. They slapped him in the face. Uh, touch was an integral part of Jesus' ministry. You, you remember how Jesus was criticized when the, when the woman wanted to touch the hem of his garment. Uh, people, they, they surrounded Jesus and they closed in on him because they wanted to touch him for healing. And many times it was Jesus who would reach out and he would touch people and, and he, would, he would heal them by touch. Our worship can be a physical experience. When we sing, you know, we might raise our arms and our hands to the Lord. During the worship, we, we might grab hold of the person next to us and, and, and kind of hold, hold their hand as we worship. Uh, someone responds to the gospel message and they come to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They come to recommit their life or they come to make some decision and we put our arm around them, around their back or, or around their shoulder or whatever to kind of encourage them in the decision that they make. True worship calls us to embrace one another, not to push people away, not to inflict harm on them. But you see, when the soldiers slap the face of Jesus, that, that crown of thorns that they had put on his head had caused his, his blood to flow down from his head down upon his face and as they as as they slapped his face the blood of Jesus got on their hands got on their hands some of that blood was transferred to them and it was that blood that Jesus shed that spilled out that paid the penalty for our sins now, as we look at this passage, no doubt the soldiers blatantly mocked Jesus by their false worship. And then they did everything that they could to, to rid Jesus from their lives. And I wonder if that kind of worship doesn't happen sometimes today. Now, now we may not be as blatant and, and disrespectful as these soldiers were, but sometimes I wonder if we come to worship and nothing changes. We leave, we come, we worship, and we leave the same. And, and sometimes I wonder if we come to worship and, and, and our worship is just a show. Or we come to worship just because someone expects us to be in the worship service today. And, and our, our worship becomes a mockery to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I, sometimes I wonder if we are not guilty of pretending to worship God. Do we proclaim Jesus on Sunday morning as our Lord and Savior, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and then the rest of the week we do all that we can to kind of... Um, um, banish him from our thoughts and our actions and our plans. I wonder, I, I wonder if sometimes our worship is not torturous to God. Now the magi, the wise men, they knew that following Jesus requires worship. 
If we're going to follow Jesus, if we're a follower of Jesus, we have to worship him. It, it, it just flows from following him. And so these, these magi, they left their land. They journeyed away. Where are you going? I don't know. We're going to see the king. We're going to find Jesus. Well, where is he? I don't know. But we've seen this star that appeared. And as I was sharing with my class this morning, the star appears and they follow it. But somehow or another, the star must have disappeared because they end up in Jerusalem. And, and so as they're walking um, and, and as they're headed toward following the star that's in the sky and it disappears, they don't turn around and go back home. They just keep walking almost by faith. By faith, they kind of got off track. But they were doing the best they could. They end up in Jerusalem. So, so they, they, they left their land. That's a big deal. They, they knew that following Jesus required worship and they weren't going to let little obstacles get in the way of their worship. And so they find the baby. They find the two-year-old boy. And they bring him because they're going to worship him. They bring him costly gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They bow down in worship and they leave changed. They are different people when they go home. They travel a different route when they go home. True worship. Here, here it is. I said, I told you, I promised you if you'd stick with me, we would come to find out what true worship, the marks of true worship are all about. I know in the, in the, in the bulletin it says, uh, the title of the message is, is Gifts for Worship. And then if you look at the outline, it says Marks of Worship. Um, yeah, I was kind of in between and betwixt. Okay? The, the marks of worship, these are the gifts. The marks of worship. True worship requires real sacrifice. And it results in permanent change. True worship requires real sacrifice. What you sacrifice this morning to be in worship? What are you sacrificing to worshiping God, to worship God? And it requires permanent, it results in permanent change. Which kind of worship do you bring to the king today? Which kind of worship? Fake worship or real worship? As we begin the new year, let us offer up true worship to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you stand with me as we sing our hymn of commitment this morning? And if there's a decision that you need to make today, a decision to, to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, to make a commitment to him, to maybe commit, say, this year I'm going to worship the Lord in a real, true way. You come, you make that decision this morning as we sing together.